Cool, so yeah, I'm Lucas Hansen. I'm one of the co-founders of Qualia, and uh, we build software for the title and escrow industry. Uh, these title and escrow shops are essentially intermediaries um, during a, you know, a real estate transaction between the borrower and the seller. And they handle a lot of the legal documents, they handle a lot of research into the history of the house, they handle a lot of the money, a lot of the relationships. And what we do is we build uh, the primary software platform that they spend you know, their entire day in. So I called this talk 3,000 Years into Meteor. Uh, I guess it's been about 3,000 hours. It's a lot of Meteor. We started about a year and a half ago, and we're mid-20s uh, headcount. Um, and I've been spending pretty much all day, every day in Meteor. So I'm going to share some of the stuff that I've found uh, useful and helpful and some of the challenges that we encountered. So some of the primary design challenges that we had in developing this application, you know, it's a very heavy enterprise application. We have to manage and generate thousands of legal documents that vary from region to region. There's significant regulatory complexity, especially since the real estate crisis, the whole real estate industry is under lots and lots of scrutiny. And so, you know, we have really stringent security requirements from the government, from the lenders, from everyone. There are dozens of integrations with insurance underwriters, with data brokers, with lenders, with everyone. Um, it's a very, very complicated workflow. You know, uh, these escrow companies, they're sort of the, you know, the end of the line when it comes to dealing with all of the details of the transaction. And so there's not a linear flow through their job. Uh, the branching factor is extremely high. And of course, it's very high liability. If we generate one of these legal documents and it's incorrect, or if we mess up their accounting, then that can result in, you know, the loss of like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we have to be very, very careful. So I'm going to go ahead and give a demo. So this is just one of our QA sites, so all these orders are bogus. It would be way more fun to show you a prod site, but like I said, uh, regulatory complexity. So. so this is our order search page right here. Uh, each of these rows in this table represents a different real estate transaction. So that means you know the purchase of a house or the sale of a house. I'll go ahead and click into one of these transactions. Uh, when you click here, you can see sort of a dashboard for uh, the basic information about this real estate transaction. And along the top here, we have tabs that let you quickly switch between uh, you know, some of your more recent transactions. Um, so I'm only going to be able to do a very brief overview because there is a lot of functionality here. But very briefly, uh, on the left-hand side here, we have something that allows people to come as close as they can to like a linear uh, flow through the uh, real estate transaction process. We have lots of information. So you know, over here is the most basic information. You have information about when the house is going to sell, when the money will be dispersed, how much everything costs, what kind of transaction it is, who's selling it to you, what's your source of, bu your source of business, et cetera. Over here, we have information about the property. And this pulls in with all sorts of integrations with different data brokers to pull in information about like the parcel ID of the house, uh, who the various like legal entities that are associated with uh, properties that are sold in this area. We have a order CRM. Um, so we track all this different information for the various parties in the real estate transaction. Loan information. You know, we have information about like calculating different uh, local taxes and prorations and things like that. And so there's lots and lots and lots of this. So clearly I'm not going to go through all of it and I haven't even gotten to like the larger sections. Um, there's all this stuff, and what's on the side here can actually vary a lot depending on the type of real estate transaction. Um, so some of the other sorts of things that we do, other than you know mounds of data entry, we actually have like many tens of thousands of fields, and uh, that's just because there are many tens of thousands of fields that go into generating these legal documents. Uh, we are also integrated with uh, different insurance underwriters. So it's possible for you know lots of different types of insurance get issued when you're uh, buying a house. And uh, you can issue a lot of those different types of insurance through our platform, which saves our users tons and tons of time. So to get a feel for you know, a few of the documents that we can generate, this is our document management uh, section. So let's suppose that you're doing a real estate purchase in Massachusetts. Then what I just did is I dragged over a folder um, from you know, some common document templates on the left here, over here. And it generated all these documents. As you can see, these were generated from information in the order. Uh, we have like in-app preview. You can refresh all these documents based off the information, the order, print it, download it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
Like I mentioned, lots of integrations. You know, we're integrated with FedEx. We're integrated with their email. Uh, we have a full accounting section. So uh, we're essentially replacing, you know, previously a lot of our customers were using QuickBooks, but that uh, results in a lot of redundant data entry um, because those are two totally separate systems. But the entire accounting system is uh, in our platform, which once again saves them tons and tons of time and makes it less likely that they're going to drop a zero somewhere and lose, you know, $20,000, which happens all the time. More integrations. Don't want to go too much into all this. This is one of the more important forms that are generated out of our platform. This is like the most important form in a real estate transaction. This is a particularly cool demonstration of how Meteor works because a lot of our customers will have two monitors. They'll keep this open in one monitor and then edit the order in the other and the uh, document live updates as they're entering everything in, uh, which never fails to blow their mind, which is fun. <laughs> it is, it's quite interesting how we're doing our document generation. So we have like different types of documents that we can generate. Uh, we have like a PDF type document where you sort of specify coordinates on top of a PDF and you send it to our document generation microservice and it'll just draw on top of it. We have a uh, Word document one where you can like template Word documents, but the coolest one is uh, you can actually create your document templates in Blaze and uh, you get automatic live previewing of these documents on the client uh, and on the server they will be rendered by like a headless browser. So. Uh, what that means is you have this live preview right here, and uh, without any additional code, uh, you know, we can have it generated on the server as a PDF. So I want to get to talking to some other stuff other than the demo, but briefly, you know, we have a global CRM that tracks all of their many, not exaggerating, like tens of thousands of contacts because they have many different contacts uh, per transaction. We have all sorts of interesting reporting that can show them, you know, how much money they're making, who's taking the longest, uh, for dispersing a particular order, et cetera, accounting, admin. So I hope you guys uh, have a feel for like the level of complexity in our application. It's pretty crazy, um, and like we knew that it was going to be this crazy upfront. Like we didn't know the details, obviously, um, but the fact that we knew it was going to be this insane definitely factored into our uh, choice of stack, which I'll go into now. Right, so there were some design constraints when we were choosing our web framework, and we were in sort of an interesting situation. My background is in applied math, and my uh, other technical co-founder's background is in AI. So we didn't have a whole lot of web background, which means that we were sort of tabula rasa, like we got to choose from scratch what we thought was the best. You know, we read like hundreds of blogs and tried to anticipate the problems that we were gonna have, and we came up with this list of things that we thought were important. One, we want like a native level user experience for our customers because most of our competitors are native applications. Our users are expecting uh, really responsive applications. They don't want to know that there's some server remotely that's like making things take time. It needs to be really snappy. So you need something like latency compensation. You know, we have a lot to build and you know, in the beginning it was just the three of us. So we needed something that let us build very, very quickly. And I think that's something that Meteor is you know, very famous for allowing and we've definitely also found that to be the case. We needed something with an incredibly robust data model because like I mentioned, we have tens of thousands of fields and modeling the relationships between these fields is really difficult. Um, Meteor provides a lot of tools. Uh, in particular, I think the isomorphic data store between the client and the server, uh, Minimongo, has been crucial to our ability to build this quickly. It needs to be snappy over poor internet connections because a lot of our customers have bad internet connections. Code isomorphism because we're building a single page app and you don't want to replicate effort across the client and the server. We need a smooth learning curve because we're going to be hiring a lot of our friends. And our friends are not web developers. Our friends are, have similar background to us. So they're really smart people, but they need to learn a lot of this stuff from the beginning. So we need a tool that allows people to learn quickly. And we need a great enterprise support channels because there's just so much stuff that we have to deal with around like regulatory complexity and security. We needed like a solid company that we could uh, fall back on for support. And I'll go more into that later. Okay. So I'm going to talk about some of the lessons we learned in, uh, while building in Meteor and sort of different ways that we uh, dealt with them or what we learned. So I'm sure one that all of you guys can be um, pretty sympathetic with is like the slow build times. Um, those have gotten better in 1.3 and I expect that you know, when uh, Meteor upgrades to Node 4 and Node 6, a lot of that will also get better. But there are some things that you can do uh, as a developer to make your reload times better. 
One of those things is separating your files uh, very strictly into client and server files, because Meteor supports reloading the client side code and the server side code separately. So if you only trigger a client side reload or a server side reload, then your reload speeds will be much faster. So if you're very diligent about keeping things out of lib or adding them to both the client and the server, you can save yourself a lot in reload times. <coughs> um, don't be afraid to drop down into a profiler. Sometimes there's something silly that's slow, and you can find it very quickly using you know, the raw V8 profiler or Meteor dash dash profile, which gives lots of useful information. Or of course, Kadira, which I think is one of the most useful tools available for Meteor right now. Um, we've also noticed that Meteor is very responsive to pull requests. Uh, you know, sometimes after profiling, we'll see something that's like kind of slow, and you know, maybe it's not slow for everyone; it's only slow for us um, and maybe a couple other people. But uh, if we open up a pull request, we found that Meteor is extremely responsive in uh, getting that pull request merged. Um, and if you're doing something super janky, which we also occasionally do, and it's like not advisable to merge it back into core. You can just keep that patch locally. It's not that hard, uh, and so that's good. And of course, be just really open in communication with MDG. They have a lot on their plate, uh, and so they need like support from the community to decide how to prioritize everything. So our architecture. So like I said, you know we have to support dozens of integrations, um, and we have uh, like very stringent security requirements. So what that led us to do is we actually don't have a multi-tenant meteor server. Each of our deployments, meaning each separate title and escrow shop, it has its own database and has its own meter server and has its own stack of microservices. Um, originally, what we were doing is we were actually deploying separate AWS instances for each of our customers, but that got kind of crazy. Um, so what we're doing instead now is we've built this uh, large Docker cluster uh, that's built on a framework called Rancher. And we can uh, very, very easily deploy you know, uh, a separate stack for each of our customers uh, with like a very simple command that I'll go over in a moment. Um, this gives us a lot of advantages. You know, we get to share resources between our different clients. Uh, they're on the same the same server, even though they're not multi-tenant. And since our you know our CPU load is pretty spiky, meaning uh, there's not like high constant CPU load, it's more like spikes of CPU. The fact that they're all on the same machines saves you a lot of money. Um, and we also have like zero downtime deploys, which is very much enabled by this sort of Docker cluster setup, where you can bring up a duplicate of a customer's infrastructure, wait for it to come up, then switch the load balancer, and then bring down the other one. So we found this to be a great architecture for us. We've also invested a lot in internal tools. So uh, we've built a Qualia command line tool through which we do a lot of our development. So when people want to bring up their development environment, all they do is clone our repo and type Qualia up. And you know that uh, downloads all of the Docker containers from Docker Hub and starts them and sets up all the environment variables and brings up the Meteor server and makes, e makes sure everything is connected. And what's really cool is that our production deployment is exactly the same. You just have to specify what environment you want to deploy it to. So qualia up dash dash n prod colon jude law will bring up the jude law deployment. We also uh, we have a wrapper command for the Meteor shell. So this is the, uh, the same as Meteor shell, I believe. Uh, with the one advantage that this also works in production. So when you're, something's going on in production, it's very, very, very useful to have a shell on the server. And uh, that was actually pretty hard to figure out, but we emailed Meteor and they, they helped us out. Another thing that we found very helpful is uh, when you have a lot of devs, um, it's hard to replicate a bug between devs. So something that we have is this thing called Qualia Dump and Qualia Restore. And what that does is it dumps the state of the Meteor database and uploads it to S3. And then anyone uh, can type Qualia Restore with the name of that dump and get their database exactly in that, situ exactly in that state. So for our QA person, you know, whenever he finds a bug, he dumps the database, puts it in the GitHub issue, and then we can always replicate. So we found that enormously useful. You can also look at the status of all the containers. You can look at the logs. You can SSH into individual services. And I think one of the uh, biggest insights that we had is by making this exactly the same for dev and prod, you know, new devs that come on are immediately able to work in production environments, which I think is uh, sometimes rare. Okay, so another classic difficulty of Meteor uh, that some people talk about is like controlling reactivity. Uh, so we took an interesting approach to this. Um, we don't use template helpers at all, which sounds impossible. And by the way, we're using Blaze still. Um, so we don't use template helpers at all. And we also don't use session variables. What, uh, what we recommend is actually storing all state and all functions on the template instance itself. And this has like a large number of advantages. You know, if you don't use session variables, then you don't have global variables, which is just like good design. 
And by storing the functions on the template instance, uh, you know, these functions are able to call each other. Uh, you, know, you don't have to call template.instance every single time you want access to the template instance. Um, helpers, by default, re-render every, every time uh, anything in the data context changes. And if you have a complicated data context, that means it's re-rendering over and over again. Whereas if you define your functions on the template instance, they only uh, rerun if they actually invalidate the auto run that they're contained in. Um, I would recommend reading the tracker manual. I remember when I first started Meteor, I was like, whoa, what is this like crazy gypsy magic? Uh, but there's this very, there's very good documentation on it. And if you read the manual, you'll find out that it's actually very simple. Um, like I feel like I could write down and write kind of like a crappy version of it in like, you know, 150 lines of code, uh, like right now. And then uh, there was one abstraction that we felt was missing, uh, so I'll go over that very briefly. So sometimes you have a function which is reactive, but you only care about like a piece of what the function returns. So for example, suppose you call like template.currentData, and you don't care about everything in the data context, you only care about the name on the current data. Uh, right now that's hard to control. You know, uh, the function that it's in will just always rerun, and that leads to a lot of like inefficiency and difficulty in controlling this reactivity. Um, so what we have is we have this function that we wrote called tracker.guard, and what it does is you pass in, you know, you pass in this, anon this uh, reactive function over here, um, and it runs it and returns the value of this function. Uh, so you have name, which is, you know, the output of template.currentData.name. But what's really nice is this outer auto run is only re-triggered when name changes, not when anything in the data context changes. Uh, ultimately, I'd probably like to release this in some sort of open source thing, but there is a GitHub gist at the bottom uh, here that you know, has my implementation of this feature. OK, something that we've been encountering more and more as we get more customers is you know, like server-side performance issues. And we found that most of them are like, very possible to deal with. You just need to know a few things. So one, you have to get Kadira. Like, you pretty much just have to get Kadira. It's really, really uh, useful. And like, off the bat, will solve like 60 or 70% of your problems. Um, the second thing is when you have a query, you need to make sure that it's op log tailable. So you know, when you have a cursor that's returned in a publication, um, for certain types of queries, it will have to pull every 10 seconds. And if it's a complicated query, that means it's going to like peg your database and just like kill your application. Um, so you have to make sure that those queries are the kind of queries that can be optimized by looking at the op log tail. Kadira is great for that. Another thing, and this is just common for using Mongo, make sure that you index the fields that you need to. Um, otherwise, things will be very slow. And it's pretty satisfying when you add one index and suddenly this like huge performance problem is completely gone in one line of code. It's pretty cool. Also, uh, this is general to Node. Don't block the event loop. Um, in Meteor, uh, a lot of these problems can be solved once again in like one line of code that you just need to know about. And uh, when you're in a publication or in a method, you can call this.unblock. I think you actually need a special package for a publication. But anyways, you can call this.unblock, and that will solve like a large percentage of your uh, event loop blocking problems. Essentially, what it says is, you know, if this meteor method takes a while, it's okay to let another one run before this one finishes. And that will, that can just totally get rid of like tons of performance problems. Another important thing is uh, for long running jobs, you should spawn them off into separate meteor processes uh, or distribute them to microservices. Because once again, you know, node is single threaded. And so if it's blocking, your server is down, essentially. So you need to be very, very cognizant of that. Um, one nice hack that I found for, uh, for doing parallelism in Meteor, at least at the fiber level, is this thing called promise.async and promise.await. And essentially what it lets you do is it lets you start you know, 20 or 30 or whatever uh, parallel threads of computation. And then you can wait for them all to complete. And uh, you know, for non-CPU bound computation, this can be like, really, really effective. And this is all available in Meteor's uh, promise library, which I recommend checking out. So as far as like Meteor processes, uh, you know, I wasn't totally satisfied with the uh, best with like the way of doing that, um, and I wanted something that parallelized across both fibers and processes. So we have this library that we just call Workers, and it's pretty cool. All you have to do is Workers.run and pass in a function, um, and then this is like the argument to the function, um, and it will automatically run this code in a worker worker process and this package like automatically manages like a worker pool and like having like a Mongo back to queue and all that stuff. 
Um, where it gets really cool is when you do a ton of different jobs at the same time. So uh, for example, suppose you have like thousands and thousands of jobs, let's call them migrations, that you want to do in parallel. Um, you can pass it to this workers.map, and what it will do is it'll, it could run like 100 different fibers on each of 10 different processes. So now you have like, uh, sometimes it can make it actually go like 1,000 times faster, which is pretty crazy. And all you have to do is just like write it in this format. Um, so right, so this like returns 100 because 10 times 10, 10 times 10 is 100. This returns 0, 1, 4, 9, 16 because that is the square of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, so I am almost done. I would just like to say that I really recommend uh, large companies to get the developer subscription because eventually there's going to be a question that you're just not going to find the answer to online and it's going to be really hard. So you need to be able to ask someone. So uh, with the developer subscription, you can ask any question during a work week and get an answer within 24 hours. And you can ask like really hard questions, like really, really hard questions, and they'll still answer, uh, which is helpful. Um, and it also makes it so that like your PRs will get merged like really, really, really fast, which is once again very helpful. Uh, do I have any more time, or am I out? No more time. Okay. Thank you.